Welcome, everyone. How you doing tonight? Good to see you all here. I'm David Burns. Thanks for joining me for my live stream. And it's a pleasure to have so many of you out in the comment section. I see you out there. I see some familiar names and looking forward to seeing a lot of you that are going to be at the uh, Honey Bee Expo coming up next week. I can't believe it's only about six or seven days away, as well as the new year. Happy New Year. This would be the last live stream in 2023. And uh, we'll be making, hopefully making a live stream from the Honey Bee Expo uh, that January what, 4th or 5th, whatever that Thursday is. So looking forward to seeing so many of you. Uh, I want to say hello to every one of you in the chat. I'm starting to know more of your names and it's going to be so fun putting faces with your name. That's going to be really cool. <laughs> I just know you by a name in the chat now and it'd be good to, to know you by face. So looking forward to that. Hopefully a lot of you will be at the B Expo. And we're going to have to figure out some way to get all together wearing our Beak Squad uh, shirts and hats and stuff. And uh, you'll see this at my booth at the um, Honey Bee Expo. If you're looking for where's David Burns at, you'll be able to find this. It goes really tall all the way up to the ceiling. So you'll be able to find the Beak Squad banner. And I'll have a big picture of my face or something too. We want to thank Sherry and Jessica for moderating our uh, live stream tonight, taking care and pushing all the buttons at the right time. <clears throat> That's a great thing. And wow, I tell you what, I was thinking about the live stream. We started it this year, uh, just, just into the new year a little bit. I don't I think it was maybe February, but I can't remember what month we started. But in 2023, so far, we have had 45 live streams. That's amazing. And at 45 live streams and the live streams have uh, accumulated 330,000 views, just the live streams. That's amazing. So I want to thank all of you guys for making live streams so special. But I'll tell you what makes it the most special, not the numbers, not how many we've done, but just the community of beekeepers, the community of getting to know you guys, hanging out together. Wouldn't beekeeping kind of be boring if we didn't have each other to talk with to communicate to watch so thank you so much for being part of beak squad it means a lot and that's one of the things that i'm passionate about is making sure that my youtube channel and my live stream have true heart to them anybody can get a camera and take you in a hive and talk about bees and i want to do that but i also want to be someone that i hopefully hopefully you can see the true me the real me that I have a love for people. I want to encourage people and just help people enjoy life and enjoy beekeeping. So that's important to me. Oh man. Well, today here it started snowing and it's, I mean, it really started snowing hard and it wasn't warm. I wasn't cold enough for the snow to really stick and accumulate, which was a good thing because the snowflakes were about the size of a dollar bill. They were they were huge snowflakes. It's still snowing now. And they didn't really call for any snow, so to speak. But man, I think it's starting to accumulate. But it's not really that cold. It's only about 32 degrees. So a lot of the snow is melting. And I want to talk about that tonight. I, I want to get right into it, in fact. So we'll have time to talk about other things. Oh, did I tell, did I say this yet? But in this live stream tonight, I'm going to be talking and sharing with you guys about a special product that we sell that just for live stream members tonight, we're going to let you know when that product will be available free. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's going to be, I'll tell you more about it as we get deeper into the live stream. But in other words, we're going to have a window of time. We're going to give you a link that you can get this product free. And so stay tuned for that. I wanted to make sure you know about that. By the way, if you're watching a replay the replay of this live stream, you're miss, you're going to miss out because it's only available for, I think, about 30 minutes uh, after the live stream. All right. So let's talk about uh, all this winter weather and things that we're having going on. And uh, I want to talk about the challenges that we're facing with our bees in the wintertime. And believe me, I've kept bees since the early or mid 1990s. And I've gone through a lot of brutal winters. I started beekeeping in the cold state of Ohio. And now I live in the freezing cold state of Illinois in the prairie. And so it can be really hard sometimes uh, to deal with a lot of these cold weather events that happen and what they do to our bees. So tonight I want to share some things with you about this. 
And one of the things is I want to talk about, you know, moisture, starvation, and wind. So let's start with starvation. Um, let's see. Can you remove the David Burns EAS certified master beekeeper banner, please? We've seen more of my slides. Uh, so you, you can see that. Thank you. You can see the, the winter bee kinds here. So many of you buy these winter bee kinds every year. And they are made up of a special recipe that, that comes with them if you want to refill them. And we are sold out of them for out of them for 2023. They go on sale every August the 1st um, of every year. And they sell out pretty quick, depressingly fast. But I think we may have changed that. I think next year, if all goes right, we're going to have an abundant amount of winter bee kinds available. Anyway, so this is what I use to feed my bees in the winter time. There's a lot of ways that you can feed bees. I don't own the corner of wisdom when it comes to feeding bees. In fact, you know, everything that anybody knows, they sort of got it from somebody else. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. We just kind of make it differently, maybe. Candy boards have been around long before I was born, and I've been around a long time. But anyway, I've kind of modified the idea of the candy board. I've got insulation in there and other ingredients that are healthy for bees, protein especially. But as you can see, this is what I put on my hives and that's what we sell for customers. We've sold this for maybe 15 years now, I think. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a, a way to feed your bees in the wintertime. But a lot of people use um, sugar bricks, fondants, uh, a lot of different methods. And as you know, I don't really like pouring um, table sugar into the hive because then you got to have a lot of moisture to make that something that the bees can consume. Bees don't really have teeth where they can chew. Our candy boards actually absorb moisture from the hive and actually starts to, uh, I don't want to say dissolve. I, I got to think of a better word, but it actually um, sort of starts liquefying a little bit where the bees can slurp it up. So that's important to always keep your bees fed. Now, Here's what's going on that's depressing, okay? Uh-oh, I'll, I'll say something depressing and then we'll get out of it. We'll get more uh, happy about it. But here you go. When, when it's been warm, Jessica told us before we went on today, went on the air, she was telling us how warm it is where she lives and 60 degrees, I think. And we've had some warm weather this fall as well. And when it's warm like this, like on Christmas day, my bees were flying. Guess what? Um, if you're, if those of you that drive your cars or if you're an airplane pilot or something, anytime that you put your foot on the gas pedal, that car, that airplane is using a lot of fuel to power itself. And so that's the same way it is with bees for bees to be mobile, to be airborne, to fly around them, even, even to move around in the hive, they start consuming a lot of energy, which means they have to consume a lot of food. Thank you, Angela, for the super sticker. Appreciate that. See if I can give you a thumbs up on my screen here. There it is. <laughs> so um, bees can really use up their food uh, source resources really fast in the wintertime on warm days. All of us feel, I know when I started beekeeping, I thought, oh good, it's getting 60 degrees in the middle of the winter. This is going to be good for my bees. It was horrible for my bees because all it meant was they become more active and they use a lot more fuel. And that means they have to eat a lot more honey that's stored. They can run out of food before winter gets here. That's the depressing side of it. Now, let's get away from depression and get toward being happy about it because it does mean that our bees can move around, that they're not just going to be frozen forever. They can go out and take a cleansing flight. That's good. Good for that. But what about food? We need a replacement food. So that's why it's important to put something like a candy board, some fondant on the top of your hive. That's that's really where it should be to help bees get through the winter. And, you know, I started this so many years ago. I wasn't the first one to ever do it. Like I said, I read a book, like a 1932 edition of um, X, ABC XYZ of, of um, beekeeping or something. And I read about uh, candy boards and those uh, old, old literature. So people were making candy boards a long time ago. They didn't have, I didn't see any ventilation in them, which I have a tiny bit of passive ventilation, which simply just turned out to be a place where bees can go out and potty on the coldest of days, which I think is amazing. Nobody much talks about that, but for bees to take cleansing flights more periodically through the winter, it makes a much healthier gut 
for the bee. And I discovered that I discovered that serendipity uh, by the bees uh, just pooping on the front of my hives. And I'm like, ooh, what's wrong? Is that dysentery? And it's like, no, nah, they're just sticking their abdomens out and taking a, they don't even fly sometimes. They just take, they just go to the bathroom on the front of the hive. It washes off, but that's good for them, especially with nosema, controlling nosema. If they can keep their gut uh, active and moving, then they, they stay a little more healthier. So that's, that's a little bit different of a winter bee kind of candy board than I read about in literature. So we have that starvation issue, bees flying because it's warm, they can starve out. So keep an eye on that. And the best way you can deal with it is keep some food on top of them. And we do have the recipe of the winter bee kinds are on our website. They're free. You can go on there and look at the product, scroll down. You'll see the recipe. You can make your own. Um, now, this image is kind of small. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger here. Can you still hear me, Sherry? Okay. So um, I drew this a while back, and it is the, oh, well, sort of like the, the common place that you would see bees or their natural habitat, I guess, would be in a hollow tree like this. And I made a little hole there. I'm not much of an artist, but this turned out where at least you can you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. But you can see where the bees go in and out, the little opening here, maybe a hole where a branch was or something. And then uh, you can see the comb with this kind of white down here. That's the comb that they were on at the start of winter. But as winter progressed, then they keep moving upward because they have their stored honey all the time. They have their stored honey above them in their natural habitat or even in a Langstroth hive. Not so much in your uh, horizontal hives. Um, they don't have anything above them because they're horizontal hives. But in their natural habitat, I've, I've taken so many bees, hundreds of bees out of buildings, structures, homes, commercial buildings. I did that uh, for several, many years with a construction partner. And um, so anytime we opened up a wall, this is what we would see. We would see all the brood down low and all the honey up high. And that's kind of like, if you think about it, when it gets colder, heat rises in this pocket. And so the bees, that dark brown area is the cluster of bees. They're clustering together, kind of staying warm. They don't hibernate. They stay active. They're just waiting for a good day, like all of us. And they just cluster, kind of get close to each other and get warm. And they go up into that honey that they've stored above them which is really something I can't really wrap my mind around. I keep asking myself over and over again, why do we put a hive together? I don't know if you can see this one. Uh, you can a little bit, but you, you put a Langstroth hive and you put supers on it and all the bees store all this honey up in their supers. And then we take the honey off and bottle it and sell it or use it. Right. And uh, then our bees are left with nothing. They're storing that for a reason. They're storing it because they know that they need it for, a dearth of cold, a dearth of no flowers, a dearth of cold season, something they need it for that rainy day, that emergency time. And oftentimes we take too much away. So let's be careful that we might want to overwinter with a super on and make sure bees have a good amount because even if they have honey down in their deeps, they will move up into boxes above them. And so they'll sometimes abandon frames of honey in your deep boxes, well, at least here in the north to go up higher in the hive to get warm. So they're going to need to have some uh, food source above them, as you can see in this image. Hey, thank you, James. Good middle name there. Maybe that's your last name, but uh, super sticker. Appreciate that. Really do. So in this uh, tree, this is kind of what our bees are trying to do in the wintertime too, in their natural habitat. They're trying to move up into the food and the heat of the hive when it gets cold. Going to get pretty cold around here in Illinois. It's going to be, uh, bees going to be hard clustered, uh, for about a week now. It's not going to get uh, much into the 40s. I uh, I went cycling today when it was only 30. Hmm, it was 32, 34 degrees. And I was, my toes and fingers were cold. I cycled past my bees and nothing going on there, man. They were clustered inside of there. Wow, they were cold. So the next thing I want to talk about is the... Um, the windbreak. Well, let me go back because I want to talk about moisture. So in this situation, you have a pretty thick tree, maybe six inches of a the thickness of the tree. And you have a big open uh, cavity that the bees are usually in. And so we often don't think moisture is a problem because they're, the moisture is 
a condensation that develops between the contrasting temperatures of hot and cold temperatures. And so in this case, the, the, the thickness of the tree would prohibit the accumulation of moisture because there's, there's not a real sharp contrast of temperatures where those contrasting temperatures meet really abruptly, like a three quarter inch piece of pine that your hive is made out of. But the top is the big thing that you can really benefit keeping the moisture level down by putting um, some sort of insulation on the top of your hive. It really does help. It could, it could be something that would even help if you put it on the outside, but most of us prefer it to be on the inside. But anything that we can cut down on the sharp uh, contrasting temperature will we'll really cut down on the moisture. And so in my case, I'm just using this winter bee kind board to absorb the moisture, but it does have insulation on it too, on the other side of the candy. So that's how we deal with moisture is by trying to ventilate the top just a little bit. I'm not a, not a big uh, fan of things like quilt boxes, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying they don't work. I'm just saying I'm not a big fan of quilt boxes, uh, boxes with holes in them, hot boxes, whatever. A lot of people, and I've tried them, believe me. I've, like I said, I've been keeping bees since the nineties. And so I've tried everything twice. <laughs> I think I tried some things each, like every decade I'll revisit it, but it still can't get stuff to work. And one of the things I can't get to work is putting fabric in some kind of a quilt box and let it uh, help my hive to get rid of moisture. All it did was I had fi fabric hanging out of it and the fabric would get wet and the moisture would just go in. It would just wick inside. So I don't know if I didn't know what I was doing or what, but it just didn't work well for me. <coughs> Excuse me. So I experimented with some windbreak. That's our next subject about bad things that happen to bees in the wintertime. We talked about starvation. We've talked about moisture. Now let's talk about wind. I wish I lived in a place where the wind doesn't blow. Some of you don't have a lot of wind. I visited, uh, I, I had some business I had to do several years in a row. I don't think I'm going to have to do it again anytime soon, but in Alabama, <coughs> I got a frog in my throat. I don't have a cup of water, but um, I was in Alabama. I don't remember what, uh, oh, I was near the Alabama Talladega Raceway area down there. And there was no wind at all. It was just like I was on top of this big gigantic hill, maybe a mountain, and it just wasn't any wind. And I'm like, man, if this was Illinois, man, I'd be blown off of this thing. I mean, it's crazy how much wind there is here in the Midwest, on the prairie especially. I mean, I you can that's my property, by the way. It's dark, but you can look out the window, and I can see all the way to Alabama from, <laughs> from my flat prairie land. Uh, it's that bad, but there's nothing to stop the wind. And so one year, probably 10 or 15 years ago, this is a picture I took probably 2010. I don't know. I experimented with all kind of crazy stuff. How do you make a wind block, you know? And so this was just some VisiQueen that I tacked up and uh, tried to keep it open where the bees could fly in and out, but it would at least provide a, that's, we're looking directly west. It would, it would provide west, south, and north wind block. That's one of the ways that I experimented with, but, you know, that's kind of labor intense. And this is the coolest thing I think I've ever done is I built a tiny, well, not tiny, I built a frame because I used to put black, uh, roofing paper around my hives. That's an old time trick from way back. You know, I don't see people doing that anymore, but that, that's about all we had back in the old days. We'd put a thicker felt uh, roofing paper around our hives to staple it on there. In fact, you can go back to my channel and watch videos that I made back when I was a young kid. <laughs> and I was actually showing you how to do this, but I built this frame a little bit larger than the hive and a little bit taller than the hive. And then you can see it's just a frame that I stapled this black roofing paper onto. And then it's real lightweight because this is just strips of plywood to make it that way. And then I would just slip it over the top of a hive. Now, if you have a lot of hives, that's why this became easier than the, than the VisiQueen because VisiQueen had to have stakes in the ground where this one, you could just make a whole bunch of these. And if you're a backyard beekeeper with 10 or 20 hives, you could make these and drop them down over your hive. And they did work really, really well. I, I really enjoyed doing that. And uh, I kind of shifted later on and just after a lot of studies, I found that for me, wrapping did not make a 
really all that much difference. So that was too much labor, but that was one of the things I was experimenting with. So then I just went to kind of letting the bees overwinter like this here in Illinois, where they just get covered with snow. By the way, we're looking at the hive uh, toward their entrance, and you can see the, the entrance of the hives are totally blocked off, right? It's so cold that they're not going to want to fly out anyway, but my winter bee kind has an opening at the top up here, and that's where they're going to fly out of that. Yeah, I'm overwintering a little a little smaller box over there. But anyway, you can see that this is what bees are dealing with in the wintertime. They're dealing with moisture in the hive. They're dealing with starvation, running out of food because it will warm up and they get active. And they're dealing with the wind, and the wind really does uh, make the hive a lot cooler, uh, makes it a lot colder. When I was doing a lot of studies, um, I wanted to share this with you guys. I think this is um, amazing when I was doing this work. Um, it's hard to see in the picture, but this uh, is a top cover. You know, I don't use inner covers, so I just have top covers on my hives. And again, this was way back. This is like 2000 and 200 something, like 2007 or 8. I don't know, maybe before that, but it's a long time ago. And I took pictures of this top cover that was on a very active hive. And so I took the top cover off and I was like, whoa, wow. And so I had my camera, you know, it wasn't real high quality back then, but I took a picture. You can't really tell it, but those are stalactites, like over there, these little sharp uh, pieces. Uh, they're actually just, uh, it's upside down. I flipped my top cover upside down. This, this ice was facing the bees on the inside. That's what you're looking at. This is frost or ice that has developed. It, so what happens is there's humidity that develops. I didn't have any insulation on the hive. It's just sitting out there in the wintertime. Contrasting temperatures cause condensation to develop on the bottom side of the top cover. And then it froze because bees only keep each other warm, not the top of their hive, obviously, on the inside. So again, this is inside the hive. And it's a quarter inch thick of frost or ice inside the hive on their top cover down all the way to the top of the frames cluster was probably lower in the hive is why that was able to do that but guess what as the cluster moves up and as the, uh, the sun comes out or a warmer day it will cause all this ice to melt and it will drip down on my bees that's what i was experiencing and as it dripped down on my bees it would actually um, get my bees really wet and it would kill my bees cold wet bees so i began studying it more uh, in depth. And so I bought this little device. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money to spare back then, but I scraped up enough money to buy some electronics and, and I got this device and I modified it with this uh, bottom board screen and, and some tape. And I, so the bees wouldn't get on my sensors and I, I put it in the hive to begin monitoring it. So what I did was I put a hive very close, not really right up against, but close to my building far enough where I could run an ethernet cable to my hive back to my laptop. So I set up a laptop feeding me back information of the humidity, the moisture in the hive and the outside, or see the inside temperature. And, and this, this telemetry stuff allowed me to kind of evaluate um, what was going on in the hive as far as moisture and in temperatures. And it, it was very interesting. All of this led me to understand that, Oh my gosh, if I can just place some candy on my bees and uh, for the winter time, then I could actually have the moisture be absorbed in the candy to make the candy edible to the bees as kind of a syrup um, once the moisture would kind of start loosening the, the sugar boards. And then my bees would generate heat because they were eating sugar. Just like, you know, when you eat, we, we, you get hotter. Uh, the blood kind of rushes to our stomach area, help with digestion. And everybody's always warmer when you eat. You, you're ju you just get warmed up. And the bees are the same way. The more they eat, the more they can use their thoracic muscle and generate heat. And so that's what I attempted to do by just combining these three problems of my hives have too much moisture. My hives are starving. My hives have a lot of wind hitting them. So I just decided, okay, I can get rid of these things by just uh, putting that candy board on top of them. The wind, I can't do much about, but anymore, if I keep feeding my bees, they stay really warm. And I like these FLIR cameras. I'm going to be using some FLIR cameras pretty soon where you can actually 
see the cluster. You can see the heat. You can measure the temperature of the inside of what the bees are doing. And that's just fantastic. You should really get one. I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk more about that in a few videos, but uh, that will give you an idea of how your bees are doing. But I've borrowed some before and I've, I've been amazed that my bees, a lot of my bees don't cluster eating that winter bee kind candy because they're so warm eating that candy. It's amazing. Yep. Just incredible. Hey, well, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Talk about uh, some of the things you got to be careful of, of these things that can happen in the winter time. Thank you, Daniel, for your uh, donation night. Appreciate it so much. Really do. Never want to, never want to um, pass up these opportunities to thank you guys for supporting the channel so much. Um, and especially last week when so many of you were so kind to give to uh uh, Jessica that's helped us all year, a great Christmas gift for her. So thank you guys for that. Um, yeah. So, uh, thank you, Mark. I thank you. Mark's a great supporter of the channel as well. I appreciate that. And, uh, always great to see Mark uh, with us tonight. I uh, always enjoy talking with Mark. Um, so, um, getting ready for the B expo. I'm speaking on Saturday uh, at nine 30 in the morning. So I've been spending a lot of time kind of with my talk, getting that ready, thinking about, um, things I want to share, but I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be in East hall a at nine 30 Saturday morning. For those of you that will be there, please stop by and, and hear my talk. I'm speaking one time and we'll have a booth there as well. And a bunch of us are going to be there. Uh, my team, Everybody but Jessica. Jessica can't make it uh, this year, um, but um, uh, I like. I wish she could. If you guys would meet her, but she'll probably be there next year. But she had other obligations. Can't make it. But my team would be there. You'll be meet a lot of my family members that'll be helping us out, and and of course uh, we have our Beak Squad merch uh, personnel, Candy and Robbie. They'll be there helping you guys with all the uh, products that you may have pre-ordered your beak squad product. So be sure and stop by our booth. You'll see us there, but I'm looking forward to it. You know, we only live about three and a half hours from Louisville. So, uh, it won't be that difficult for us to, uh, actually, uh, have to spend a lot of time getting there, be pretty close by. So we're looking forward to that. A lot of stuff to take down. Hey, Brian, uh, I know you're going to be there at the B Expo, Brian. You've already told me you were. So look, I look forward to meeting you, Brian. I don't think I've ever seen you in person. If I have, I've forgotten your face if I met you last year. But um, looking forward to seeing Brian. Thanks for your donation. Big supporter of the channel as well. And I, I just want to say before we get into some question and answer time, Fola, thank you for your donation so much. I can't remember. You look like the person that i always see at eas every year we have a good time together are you that person i can't remember i don't remember your name but let me know if you are uh the eas friend that we hang out together at eas you, you look a lot alike but i can't tell by your picture for sure but i appreciate your donation um but i was thinking about uh just all the plans that go into um that cayman must be going through to put his conference together is incredible because I'm going through a lot of plans and I'm not doing anything, but speaking once Marianne Livingston, thank you so much for your super sticker. You're a great supporter. Uh, but all of you guys that support us, it, I tell you what, it's just incredible. It really is. Um, it's a lot of fun doing the live streams and being supported, but what was I talking about? I was going to go down a road or something and then I got sidetracked and I can't remember what I was saying, but I was going to say something, but I'll switch gears until it comes back to me. But, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, being with a lot of other content creators. Uh, I created content. I started creating content on YouTube in 2008, 15 years ago. And it was pretty lonesome. There wasn't anybody else around. And once more, I mean, now there's so many beekeeping channels. Wow. Everybody has started a beekeeping YouTube channel. I think it's great. It gives everybody a lot of options. And uh, some the other day, there was somebody here and they were visiting and they were like, you know what? Your channel, you are an OG. And I'm like, I'm an OG. Okay, what does that mean? You're like, well, that means you're kind of like the original original gangster on YouTube. You know, YouTube looks at you guys that have been there forever as an OG guy. But I have been on YouTube just by default. I didn't really have a plan or anything. I just started making videos about beekeeping. And then I just lived long enough and 
stayed with it long enough that it grew into something like this, which I love because I love being able to share with you guys and help you guys. Thank you for your super sticker. I just saw that. So, you know, with when I think about uh, you guys and what you mean to me, that's what motivates me to make a lot of videos. I know a lot of you, I made a video two or three videos ago, and a lot of you left comments about you starting in the sp spring for the first time. And I was just really amazed that hundreds and hundreds of comments were talking about, we're starting in the spring. So, so many of you watch my channel that are brand new beekeepers. Victor, wow, thank you. Look at that bee on goldenrod. That's awesome. You must be a photographer and a beekeeper. Good picture. Thank you. I appreciate your donation. So, you know, a lot of times we just think, oh, everybody already knows all this stuff. But my channel, I try to give a mixture of, I've, I've taught, I've taught, uh, well, I've had YouTube ch uh, videos on American fowl brood, more in depth of bacterium and all that. And then I also come back around and talk more on an introduct introductory level for those of you that are brand new. So I'm excited for all of you and I hope that I can continue to help you. The recent videos I've made on which is better, the nuke or the package, that's really cool. I've been answering a lot of your questions about that. A lot of you just, you know, you're brand new to it and all these things are unfamiliar. I get it. So I'm here to help you. It's really exciting uh, times. So yeah, let's go ahead and have uh, time for some questions. And don't forget in just a little bit here, I'm going to give you information on how you can take advantage of one of our products that we're going to make available for free here shortly. So stick around. Okay. Hey, Gene, how are you? Beeswax coated hives, are they warm for the winter? Uh, I'm not an expert about that. I'm just going to have to go out on a limb here and say, I do know that when you wax dip boxes, it gets a lot of the moisture out of the box, out of the wood, and it's replaced by that wax, which seems to me that it would make it less the, the whatever it would just kind of make it more sealed off thanks don i appreciate your donation yeah i'll see you at the expo be sure and come up and say hi to me don i really want to meet you but i think the wax in there is going to help it but don't count on it really being anything significant okay i mean it is getting moisture out and replacing it with wax but yeah let's let's find uh, let's let's have healthy bees a lot of bees in there to get our heat from the bees but i'm not i'm not really sure how much that's going to help you Okay, how often do you check your winter bee kinds um, to how much food the bees have left? Uh, that's a good question. To be honest with you, I think a no longer than every two weeks. And because in, in a week, I've had, I've had some of my hives eat a winter bee kind board in one week, seven days, or sometimes less than that. So try to go out there as often as you can, at, at least once a week or once every two weeks at the latest for sure but always have one ready to go because you may have to replace it with a with an, an another one so take take that one off and fill it back up with the recipe we gave you yeah uh randall how are you david can you use deep box and a medium box on on top on top thought on that hmm Am I missing something? David, can you use deep box and a medium box on top? <laughs> I'm not sure the question, but let's just say if you're asking me, um, can you use a, a deep box and a medium box together? That's a little too simple. Yeah, you can. So you must have, maybe you're thinking of some, swing back around and make that a little more uh, understandable. And I'll try to do my best on that. Thank you, Gene, for your super sticker. Yep. Yeah. When you ask me a question, I know you guys are typing and you're, you're in a hurry and you're trying to get your question on there. Just take your time, carefully type it out, read it once or twice, make sure that you understand it because if you don't, I'm not going to understand it either. <laughs> I'm way behind you. EL, thank you for your super sticker. You guys are really being great tonight and generous. I, I really do appreciate that a lot. Um, really do. Had to do some extra things tonight to make our internet, uh, beefed up a little bit. So your, <laughs> your money will help cover the cost of that, I think. So I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. We'll go with Andy. Hi y'all lost one of my three hives upon inspection, not a ton of dead bees on the bottom. A baseball size cluster was all that was left dead. 
Can you discuss colony collapse disorder and the varroa mites? Yeah, that's a tough one, Andy. I'm not sure when you lost your hive. If you lost it already in the cold season, uh, it's it's probably just because the hive is really small and and very very um, got too small and too low population and it got too cold and maybe just perished. Um, baseball size cluster, the colony collapse disorder really struck us, uh, kind of came about in 2006 is when we became aware of it. We had uh, large scale beekeepers that were experiencing this kind of bees just leaving the hive, just l vanishing and not many bees left at all. And when it was all said and done, and a lot of research was done on it, uh, most scientists agreed that it had to do with poor nutrition was one of the earmarks of it, but it could have had, it had to do with nothing. We, it's a disorder, you know what I mean? A colony collapse disorder. It wasn't anything we could just say, oh, they got bit by a bug or, oh, they got you know, this kind of bacteria. It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't a, a pathogen. It was more of a disorder, combination of several things. Could have been the combination of mites, uh, poor nutrition, and just th the bees were just experiencing this. I will say that in some of my research way back then, I found a lot of the literature referred to this type of uh, scenario long before 2006. 1800, 1960s, and it was called things like fall dwindle disease. Do you guys remember that if you've been around a long time? And it was a similar symptoms of fall dwindle. So there were a lot of people that were saying, this is just what we've had forever, and somebody just slapped a new name on it. And we've always had this issue that came about. So I don't know. But anyway, it seems like... I don't hear much about it anymore. I don't really see it at the forefront. I don't really see people talking about it. I don't know if we got better at nutrition and controlling mites or whatever, but correct me if I'm wrong, but you just don't hear much about it. Of course, when it came about in 2006, everybody was like, wow, bees are all going to die. We're all going to perish. And even um, everybody started misquoting, I think, Albert Einstein that said, you know, we can only live so many years without bees and we're all gone. And and nobody can ever find where he ever said that. It just started circulating. You know how the internet goes, but that's that's colony collapse disorder. So regarding your hive, I don't think it's a colony collapse disorder. Sounds like low population. Um, Renee, I think I washed the queen on October the 5th. Do you think there's a possibility that the bees were able to make a new queen before winter? Ooh, I'm not sure where you live, so I really can't speak to that. However, here in Illinois, that would have not been possible. It really wouldn't have. We would have had not many, uh, we wouldn't have had many drones left at that time, and we wouldn't have had good flying days. If we did have drones, there wouldn't have been, they, the drone congregation areas where all the drones hang out and wait for a virgin queen to show up, they weren't, they wouldn't be very filled up with, uh, with, drones plus the queen herself if they did raise a new queen would be pretty hard for her to find find a day that is above 68 or 70 degrees maybe to take that mating flight so let's hope for the best though that a miracle happened and yeah maybe it did happen um i'd like to know how you washed her i guess you mean you did an alcohol wash maybe and got the queen in the alcohol wash um uh, that's that's too bad um, it'd be amazing if your hive does survive. And if it does, uh, you might have to find a friend or somebody close by that maybe has a queen that an extra queen they can spare and drop one in there as soon as you can. Um, that'd be great. You know, I've thought about this, uh, a little bit before I, before I answer Brad, I, I thought about, can you really put a queen in a hive during the winter? I've never done that, but yeah, you could, if you, if you had a queen in queen cage, and let's say the cage is in the house, staying warm, and bees, attendant bees in there. Anyway, if you had a cage queen and you walked out there, you could open the hive up. And if the bees were, you know, near where you can see them, you don't want to pull frames up, but you could actually slip a queen cage into a cluster of bees and they would eat the candy out and get her out. And that might save the day. I, <laughs> I mean, that's just like, that's Navy SEALs kind of stuff there. I mean, that's just tough stuff right there. I mean, that's just things you don't normally would, would consider. 
All right, where'd Brad's question go? Brad Marshall, I saw him. Oh, I need Brad. Get Brad back up there, girls. <laughs> there he is. Thank you. At what temperature in the winter will a queen lay eggs? The queen will lay eggs, Brad, uh, all winter long. She has to lay eggs all winter long. Not many because, you know, they're clustered. It's cold. They're not feeding her as much as they do on strong nectar flows. But they will continue. Now, she'll pick up the pace as the bees start foraging. If you have, oftentimes we think of a carniolan bee, the carniolan type of bee, that they're more apt to start laying a lot more as soon as the bees start bringing in nectar, where we often say Italian bees lay more in the wintertime when it's colder. But I'm not a big um, proponent of these strict genetic lines. I don't think, you know, it's haploid, diploid genetics, and I don't think we have strong I don't think we have the ability to really stay pure lines on honeybees. Mm, yeah. All right. Waiting for another question. Yeah, here we go. What causes a dead out? Yeah, um, dead outs are normally caused by low population, which is usually a, a bad queen during, this, during the fall that didn't keep up with bees of winter physiology, not laying enough eggs. So we had a poor queen or they weren't able to feed her a lot uh, in the fall to lay a lot of eggs. The, the hive was starving. They were protein deprived. That's why I always feed bees in the fall. A dead out can be caused from low population. It can also be caused um, from things like pests and diseases. Sometimes your bees can contract things in the fall or in the winter and they can just die out. But normally it's low populations. Of course, it can be viruses that are spread by the viral destructor mites. So bees that have viruses, we think that they only have half of their, they only live half their life. So if uh, the winter bee is going to live, let's say six months, they only live three months. So now they're dead in March in the winter time. So they're going to they just keep dying out for things like that. Sad, isn't it? Beekeepers of Oasis. Uh, thoughts on rearing queens in queen castles and hotels. Uh, okay. Um, I started... When I started raising queens, I, I started making a lot of queen castles and queen hotels. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with these terminologies, what it means is you take a deep box and you usually cut, no, you can buy them, but we were, we were making them. And so you cut two slots in them on the insides, on the front and the back of the box on the inside. And then you slide into the slot, these mason, masonite boards, and that makes a barrier. So now you have a deep box that has three compartments to it. And then you make external holes on the outside for openings. Uh, the front, one of the box, one of the compartments will have an opening because it faces the front of the hive. But the two on the edges, you're going to have to make uh, either in your bottom board is what I did. I didn't want to, I didn't want to damage my boxes. So I just cut slots in my bottom boards. And uh, so I have three, basically three mating nooks is what you have. And so you could put three frames in each of those. So I did not have good luck with my queens getting mated in queen castles. I did not. I don't know why. I was kind of in a desperate situation to raise a lot of queens. I didn't have time to figure it out. So I just went back to having, uh, I made up three frames and five frame mating nooks so that would hold deep frames. That's what works best for me. Hey, Jen, which bee is better for a new beekeeper? Italian, Carniolan, and thank you. Okay, so here it is. Okay, you got you to gotta get this. This needs written down, and I need to be quoted on this because this is a question I get asked year after year, month after month. I wish I had some answer that everybody could just go to and look it up, but I'm not a, I don't really believe that we have that sort of control over these types of what people refer to as races of bees, like the, the Italian bee or the Carniolan bee. I don't think we have real strong, the, I don't think we have real strong abilities to keep those purely Italian or purely Carniolan or Buckfast or Caucasian, you know? I mean, I never could. And, I, and then I found that if you have a mutt, a mixture of a lot of different kind of genetics, those bees do a lot better. So I've, I'm a mutt, I, I, I'm a mutt proponent of, of mutts, of, of bees, of a lot of different genetic traits. I really am. Um, that's important to me. So 
How are you going to know that you're getting an Italian B? I mean, you're going to get any kind of paperwork that says what their progeny is and how much Italian B are they? They've done a lot of studies and most studies show it's just a big mixture here in America of all these different types of bees that have just bred together. So I wouldn't worry about it. Here's what you need to do, though. You need to buy a queen from a reputable place that has a reputation of some history of providing very good queens. That's about all you can do. Yep. Or learn to raise your own. That's what I did. And that works out better than anything else at all. Learn to raise your own queens, and you'll be amazed at how much better your hives will do. Absolutely. Oh, you raise the queens, by the way, out of your best performing hives. So if you got, uh, let's say, let's say you're a new beginner, but you got a couple of hives. They both make it through winter or no, you got two hives. Let's say one dies, one makes it through winter. Well, now you can raise queens out of the hive that made it through winter because there's something about that hive, something about those genetics that you like. And so you just start raising bees out of the hive that survived. See how that works? And then all at once, you've got the best queen in town. When do the bees stop making winter bees? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I would say, you know, winter bees are made uh, in the fall when they anticipate a dearth. So I think once they are in the clear of a dearth, I would say everything shifts. So certainly by time any sort of nectar flow starts, the winter bees kind of perform their last minute work orders and then they perish. And so they don't raise any more to replace them. They raise these short lived bees, summer bees, 30 to 45 days. Oh, I'd recommend David's online bee classes to everyone. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. I really, I really enjoyed, uh, <laughs> I was reading it and it went away. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed the advanced bee class. Like Todd David caught the queen and marked her. Okay, well, good. Yeah, the advanced bee class. That's pretty pretty much into the, the diseases and pathogens and what's to do with that. I've always kind of, I never really liked um, talking much about all the diseases about bees, especially in a beginner's class, because I think it just makes people feel like, oh, no, and everybody becomes hypochondriac about every time they look at their bees, their, their bees appear sick because they've been exposed to all these pictures about diseases. But I'm glad you enjoy the advanced class. How often do you check your bees in the wintertime? No, I really don't check them that much at all, except I replace the winter bee kind. So I'll go in there and I'll just look at the winter bee kind, replace it, but I'm not going to be able to do uh, any kind of bee inspection where I can pull frames up. You can take the top cover off and look for a minute, not a minute, but half a minute, but you can't pull frames out in cold winter climate. Mm, good question. Yeah. Yeah. Guys are got a lot of good questions tonight. So appreciate the opportunity to answer these questions that you have. Don't feel bashful about asking your question. I know a lot of you watch on TV and you don't have a way to ask your question on TV but maybe you're benefiting from the question and answer time. Hi, David. Uh, cleaning up frames from a dead out. Is it okay to harvest the corners of honey on the brood frames? It looked pretty old. Um, yes, it's probably fine. Are you going to sell it? Or are you going to use it for yourself? You know, any honey that's in a beehive that you know the history of it, then you're the best person to make that decision. If you weren't using chemicals in the wrong time, you know, like a lot of times in the brood boxes, um, you know, anytime we treat a hive, it often says can't be treated with supers on. So we take the supers off, but down below in the deeps, we have frames down there that have honey in them. Right. So if you use some of the treatments that linger, some syn synthetic treatments that may still be in that comb and honey, I wouldn't eat it. So you have to use all these different scenarios like that. But if you're kind of a natural beekeeper, you haven't used any chemicals that got honey in there. It looks old because it's been there and it's kind of saturated the cappings. It's perfectly fine. You can go to a tree that's never been treated and find honey in there and eat it. I mean, I wouldn't be afraid of it. Would I sell it? Nah, probably not. I'd, I'd rather be able to have more control over it than uh, getting it out of my brew box. But it'd be fine for me to eat. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, hey, George. What are the best trees for bees to forage for nectar and pollen? Any fruit trees, any trees that have uh, flowers, 
uh, you know, in the spring here in Illinois, we even start off with maple trees because they, they have the flowers, the neck, a little bit of nectar, a little bit of pollen, big trees, uh, that are big winners in my area are things like, uh, black locust trees. Oh my gosh. Black locust just drips. You can hold a jar, a honey jar under a black locust tree and it'll fill up with, it's almost, I'm joking, but it's almost that crazy. It just smells so wonderful. And so any tree really that makes flower uh, and makes nectar, apple trees, orange trees, um, tulip trees, there's just so many trees. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So whatever tree grows well in your area the longest would benefit you the most. Absolutely. Black, black locust is the best for me. I live near a river and it's lined with a lot of black locust trees. What do you think of putting peppermint candy in the hive to keep beetles out? I think it worked, but the bees ate the candy. Uh, yeah. Mm, I think a lot of us have talked about this before in, in broader circles of entomologists and master beekeepers. And there's, we're not going to say it doesn't work and it isn't a big winner. It could be something that is, it wins every time it works every time. I've heard people talk about it. Um, but I've tried it before and my beetles will just go over there and eat the candy like a treat. They don't care. And I've heard other people say the same thing. It doesn't do anything. So I, I, there's too many other things that does work that I'm going to try. And before I just throw peppermint candy in there and also peppermint candy is pretty loud in smell and odor. And I wonder how that might interfere with the pheromones of the bees. I don't know. Yep. I've heard a lot of people say that. And when I tried it, it wasn't, uh, and I, somebody the other day asked me about um, the Formic Pro, the Formic Pro uh, pads that you put in that uh, control mites. Somebody said, I bet that controls beetles too. Oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no. When I took my pads out, uh, the beetles were just up there. You know, they had drawn a hot scotch, whatever. That, they were just skipping on top of the, they were just, they had a picnic on top of that Formic Pro. They didn't care that it was there. Alan, have you ever had a disease that looked like bee paralysis? A few bees were on the inner cover upside down as well as the entrance. If so, what do you think could cause bee, uh, could it be bee, uh, bee pesticide damage? Well, I've seen a few times when bees have had uh, some sort of paralysis like you're, they just, I mean, it's not that they're doing the washboard thing. It's more violent. It's like they're just shivering and shaking out of control. But I've watched you know, you know me, if you don't know me, this is what I do. I'll mark that queen or I'll mark that paralysis. I'll, I'll mark the bee. I'll get my little queen marking pen. I don't have to pick the bee up. I just chase her and put a little dab on her thorax. Then I'll watch her. And it's every time I've done this, which has only been about three or four times, that bee stops doing it. And so I don't know what to think of it. It wasn't anything serious. It's almost like the bee was just like really dancing hard and going crazy just because it could. And it was fine after that. But there are diseases that do cause this, uh, different things that would cause these bee paralysis disease. So it would be something to watch and see how many bees are doing it. Mark them like I did and see if they ever recover. We're getting close to the end of the broadcast and, uh, Maybe I'll take one more question, and then I'm going to uh, talk about the product that we're going to give away. So I've got uh, time for a squeeze in one more question to help you guys. Yep. So here we go. Uh, hi, David. Would would there be any reason to treat for mites in the winter? I'm in northern Indiana. Uh, you know what? I think I think so. I think there could be because most um, most of us would say that. In the winter, historically, beekeepers have the least amount of bee brood. Um, and then so if you're using certain treatments like, um, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, vaporization of acylic acid, for example, I know people use that in the wintertime because the brood level is low. But here's the thing. They're also clustered. So some things aren't going to work as well when the bees are clustered like that. And so... You know, that's that's a tough part to deal with. Yeah. OK, well, let me uh, go ahead and tell you guys about uh, a giveaway that I have planned for you guys. So many years ago, I was trying to help people um, with their hives and really do a good job in their inspection. You you can tell by the 
the flavor of my videos that a lot of my videos have to do with helping you um, inspect your hive, know what to do when you're inspecting. And so over the years, I put together my own beekeeping inspection guide that I used, and I would take it with me when I inspected hives. And then I started uh, once, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm part of the Eastern Apicultural Society Master Beekeeper uh, Testing uh, Committee. I'm I, I'm the team leader of the field test that we that we that we um, produce or perform every year at EAS, and so I guess I I began thinking about how I can help people do proper inspection. You know, the field test for to become a master beekeeper is pretty intense. And there's a guideline that people use and uh, that the testers use uh, when they're testing a candidate. They, they say, did they check off this? Did they check off that? They go through there. Anyway, so over the years, I decided I'd be good if I could really put together a more thorough inspection guide that beekeepers could use. Because here's what happens. Beekeepers will jump in a hive, especially new beekeepers. Hey, I, I was that way for many years. And I open a hive box with no purpose, no intention, no idea what I'm going to be doing or looking at. I just jump in there and start inspecting and I'm all over the place um, with not really knowing anything what I'm doing. So it's been my heart and goal and purpose, passion to help beekeepers go into their hive looking for something. And so this inspection guide is something I put together a couple of years ago and we have it for sale on our website. It's a PDF file that you can download and print off, put it in a three ring binder. I've made a lot of videos on how to use it, by the way. So it's $12.99. And so tonight, as soon as um, the broadcast tonight, the live stream ends, we're going to make this file, this uh, inspection guide free. It's our way of thanking you guys so much for being a part of our live stream tonight. It means a lot. I've seen all, uh, nearly 400 people here tonight. I really appreciate that. That's amazing. I'm humbled that you would want to come and listen to me talk. And that means a lot. So to, to kind of on a year in, thank you. Appreciation for you. Uh, from about 8 to 8.30, we're going to have, um, Sherry's going to be able to go in there and change the price to zero. And so you can get your free beekeeping inspection guide that I put together. It's pretty thorough. Remember, we're not going to ship you anything. It's something that you download and that you print off and that you put in a binder and take with you out there. Also, understand that if you're watching the replay and you miss the 8 to 8.30 window, please don't call us or email us and say, pretty please, can you open that back up again? Electronic products can't be handled that way. We just can't really do that. So it's an it's the opportunity right between 8 and 8.30 uh, that it's going to be helpful for all of you if you haven't already got that, we have actually, uh, a lot of you have already used that beekeeping inspection guide. So that's coming up uh, between 8 and 8.30 uh, as soon as we let Sherry go and make those changes. <laughs> okay, well, guys, I'm going to wind it up here. I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I love you guys. I wish you could be here. I'm in a pretty big room right here, and I one day I hope that I can... I got to watch. If I hold my fingers up kind of funny like this, I make all these little symbols like this. Let's see if I can make a heart over here. Tell you guys I love you. It can finally pick up my heart maybe. Yeah, there it is. See that? Hand signals. But um, anyway, this room is so big. I'd like to see a bunch of you come in here and be a part of my live stream. You could be in the audience of the live stream. Would that be fun? I would love that. I would interact better if you were here with me. <laughs> I'm looking at a, a camera. So, but anyway, nonetheless, this is what life has come to. But I think it goes beyond that. And I really do want you guys to know, I appreciate you so much. I love you. You guys are great. Supporting my channel for me is huge because I work hard to make videos for you. So it's it's reassuring to me to, to see you in the comment sections and know that you guys are watching my videos and that you appreciate us. That's huge. Thank you all for your donations tonight. It means so much to me. It really does. And uh, Jessica and Sherry, you guys were great tonight, doing a great job keeping it all going. And look forward to seeing all of you at the at the B Expo coming up uh, next week. I hope all of you are really kind of getting ready for that. A lot to take care of, a lot to do. And hope you all have a great 
Happy New Year's. And we're looking forward to some great live streams all through the next year as well. So thank you guys. And I just want to say, no matter what you're going through in life, how hard it is, how unhappy you might be, how scared, how, how much fear that you might have, or how much unhappiness you might be struggling with, or how much you may be missing somebody that you love that's now gone. Um, tomorrow's a better day. And we can choose how we feel. It's hard, not easy, but we can kind of step our game up a little bit and um, look in the mirror, smile at yourself and know that you're okay. We've got this. We're going to make this together. And that's what makes beekeeping so fun is that we're all in this together. Beekeeping has brought us together and that's cool. All right, guys, good night. Watch my videos. I've made a couple new ones uh, here recently. Hope to see you over there. Take care. See you later.